I've driven the Kia EV6, now it's the Ionic 5. How do they compare? I'll get into that, plus others like Volkswagen ID4. These days, automotive designers are handcuffed by a blizzard of governmental regulations, engineering requirements, and aerodynamic efficiencies. It leads people to say all cars appear the same. Uh, here's proof that's not true. Hyundai's Ionic 5 looks like an 80s hatchback resurrected by a future that idolizes mid-century modern design. It's the company's first purpose-built EV, and if you think it's the size of a Chevy Bolt, nope. It's bigger than many expect, slightly larger than a Tucson crossover, but a couple inches lower. Electric vehicles are finally becoming mainstream. There are so many good choices to cross-shop these days. To name a few, Tesla Model 3 and Y, Volkswagen ID4, Volvo XC40 and C40 Recharge, Polestar 2, Mustang Mach-E, and of course, the Kia EV6, which is built on the same eGMP platform as the Ionic 5 here. Obviously, Hyundai has taken a completely different approach. I won't dwell on comparing the two, that'll be a different video. But here's the EV6, looking all spaceship-like, and the Hyundai, with styling cues from 1970s hi-fi gear. It's around two inches taller and two inches shorter than the Kia, with a wheelbase four inches longer. Uh, let's do more numbers. There are three trim levels, four if you include the base SE standard range with its smaller 55 kilowatt hour battery. That one retails for around $41,000 with shipping before any federal or state tax credits. The all wheel drive limited in phantom black here, MSRPs for 54.7 is tested. With the dual motor H track, the EPA rated range is 256 miles. Running with rear wheel drive, it rises to 303. Charging? I'll start by saying I prefer the port on the driver's front quarter panel. I don't mind backing in. It's just easier remembering to plug in when getting out of the car at home. That's my opinion. I'm sticking to it. With residential 240 volt level 2, a nearly spent pack easily recharges overnight, around 7 hours. Nearly all charging is done at home, some 85%, so unless you travel a lot, you really won't be using the infrastructure, which is growing between Electrify America, EVgo, ChargePoint, and Shell Recharge here. You should be covered. However, it is kind of expensive. This particular station's speed is not advertised. A common issue? I tried charging the EV6 here a few weeks back, and the second terminal is still not fixed. I'll cover ultra-high-speed commercial charging later. First, the powertrain. Combine the 165 kilowatt motor in back and 74 kilowatt unit in front, make 325 horsepower and 446 pound-feet of torque. The lithium-ion polymer battery that's rated at 77.4 kilowatt hours on all but the base model is liquid-cooled and gets the popular skateboard design with a fully flat interior floor. Some EVs have generous frunks, others save that space for the cabin. You can guess where I'm going with that here. Uh, this is good for a travel charge cord. The Michelin Primacy Tour all seasons are not specifically low rolling resistance. Ionic 5 doesn't start by simply sitting in it. That's all you'll hear and see. Uh, speaking of, my camera doesn't show how unusually large and crisp the head-up display is. Like most EVs, there's no multi-gear transmission, and I grab the wiper controls by mistake more than once. The left paddle adds regeneration drag for one pedal driving, the right one backs it off. There are drive modes that make a noticeable difference to throttle response and steering. With dual motor all-wheel drive, Ionic 5 is pretty quick, 0 to 60 in 4.5 seconds. Not the fastest EV out there, but come on. Uh, not to be a dad, but how fast do you need to go? Rich, torquey acceleration off the line, very satisfying. And at highway speeds, lots of punch. Easy to pass RVs on two-lane roads. Nice powertrain.
Of course, burying the pedal into the carpet does nothing for efficiency, same as a gas-powered car. Once again, the all-wheel drive model that I'm driving is rated by the EPA at 256 miles of travel. In normal conditions, 70 or 75 degrees, that would be really easy to match. In Seattle, it's been kind of cold in the low 40s, and my range is down about 10%. That's actually pretty good. Word is, in the real world, owners are seeing a little bit better than the EPA estimate. I suggest checking online forums for any car that you're buying. Some EVs consistently fall short of their EPA estimate, uh, looking at you, Tesla. And all but the SE standard range model are rated to tow 1,650 pounds. Uh, but doing that will drop range as well. Welcome to physics. Because of the heavy batteries in the floor, the center of gravity of the Ionic 5 is on the low side, like many electric cars. When you chuck it hard into a corner, there is some body roll and it is set for comfort. The EV6 is more sporty. This dynamic is a little bit more like the Volkswagen ID4. Being tuned for the comfort crowd, hitting undulating pavement during hard cornering can cause the 4,600 pound limited to bound a bit. In normal driving, eh, not so much. Visibility is great in the Ionic 5. It seems like the A pillars are a little bit thinner than the EV6 and the blind spot. This is much better than the Kia. However, there's no rear wiper and if these slots in aerodynamics are supposed to clear the glass, it doesn't work well in Seattle. It's helpful that this limited model gets the trick blind spot camera system that I find extremely useful, but it only works when the turn signals are used. A little encouragement to do that. The great thing about this regenerative braking system is that you have a choice. If you like one pedal driving, you can dial it in and it stops fairly quickly. When I'm driving in a performance type setting, I don't want that. I want to drive it like a regular car. And pedal modulation from recuperation braking to using the physical pads is smooth. Tesla doesn't offer that transition. Use the brake pedal and the discs are being engaged. There is no choice. As for doing U-turns, which you do in the city all the time, Ionic 5, pretty good. It's about average, nothing really super tight. Not like the uh, Volkswagen ID4, that thing's amazing. Hyundai's suite of active electronic safety tech on Ionic 5 is pretty comprehensive. Automatic emergency braking with pedestrian detection is standard, same with adaptive cruise control. And the upgraded Highway Driving Assist 2 is a solid semi-autonomous driving system. It's not up to super cruise levels. Hands need to be on the wheel, but it does help on long trips. As you'd expect from an electric car, Ionic 5 is very quiet, or as Elmer Fudd would say, very, very quiet. Ionic 5's cabin is a relaxing, airy space with good quality materials, including synthetic leather and matte finish fabrics. It feels more like a trendy hotel than a car interior. Haptic touch controls work well. The HVAC system on all-wheel drive models get a more efficient heat pump. At night, soft, calming theater lighting bathes these panels. This kind of looks like a sound bar. Limited gets a comprehensive camera setup, but no excuses for pranging the car pulling out of a parking spot. There are large storage cubbies to swallow up stuff needed every day. If your backpack or purse doesn't fit in here, uh, my sympathies to your back. And the whole thing slides fore and aft on the Limited. Look closely and you'll see the square detail that's repeated throughout the car. There's a dedicated volume knob and tuning controls. These can be swapped with each other in the menu. Ionic 5 doesn't get the option of real leather. The synthetic stuff is very well done these days. To use the heated and vented seat features, the menu needs to be used, no hard buttons. The chairs recline dramatically, but only the driver's side gets this. Uh, good for napping. About the only thing that connects the Ionic 5 and EV6 visually are the displays. The graphics are the same, with the ability to choose light or dark mode. The Kia makes it look like one big screen. Here, they're visually separated. The interface is classic Hyundai. It works well and touch response is very good. I found the menu to be slightly different than the one found in the Kia. You'd think a vehicle this advanced and with a charging pad would support wireless Android Auto and Apple CarPlay. 
Nope, bring a cord. This makes me happier though. The glass panel is huge. Oh, and the eight speaker Bose system is worth mentioning with rich, punchy sound, loud too. Let's get back to charging. At easily half the price of a Porsche Taycan or Audi e-tron GT, the eGMP platform has a similar 800 volt system with a top charge rate of 250 kilowatts. The claim is juicing from 10 to 80% takes just 18 minutes. So I found a 350 kilowatt terminal rolling in with the pack at 14%. That's pretty much ideal conditions for speedy charging other than the ambient temperature in the mid 40s. Uh, Fahrenheit, the battery being warm and preconditioned. But the fastest take rate I saw was 150 kilowatts. Uh, getting to 80% took closer to 24 minutes. That speed's pretty good, but not as advertised. You gotta remember, there's something called a charge curve. It depends on how warm the battery is, what the temperature is outside. Also, I had issues with this terminal. First, the payment app didn't want to sync with the terminal. Switching to the second cable seemed to resolve the issue, but it never told me how much I was paying until the very end. It ended up being 12 bucks for the electrons I took on. And it simply stopped charging, twice. I had to restart the sessions. Uh, Tesla does have the edge when it comes to charging infrastructure. You look pretty happy back there. Yes, yes I am, do tell. Well, it has most of what I like in a back seat. For example, uh, we're both five foot nine. Headroom is generous. Same with knee and legroom. Footroom, uh, that is a little bit tight, but not too bad. Cushions are high and long enough so that thigh support is excellent. The door openings are big enough so that car seats go in and out and the doors themselves open up really wide. Door pockets, pretty big, lots of storage there and Built-in sunshades. There are pockets on both sides. The kids won't fight over those. There are USB ports to charge your phone and a regular household outlet. You can run a pretty powerful computer off this. It even looks nice back here. This fabric's nice. What don't I like back here? No separate climate zone or heated seats. There are adjustable vents on the B pillar. The floor, perfectly flat, meaning everybody has good foot room. And you can put three average sized adults back here, no sweats, at least for short trips across town. The seats themselves, very comfortable. And Ionic 5 has one of my favorite features, max out cargo room, max out leg room. This is a good back seat. Let's say you've returned to your car to find that it's been blocked by two vehicles parked so close, you can't get into it. Well, simply by using the fob, you can move it back so you can hop in. Could be a cool party trick. Also, it works going forward as well. And if there's something that's blocking the car's path, well, it'll stop. Glad that worked. It's fun to focus on the Ionic 5's design. Clearly, there's nothing like this breath of fresh air. It's reminiscent of the Hyundai Pony sold decades ago, though much more classy, much more modern, and much larger. In some light, it's easier to see the big dart line on the side. I'm thinking the designers play a lot of Minecraft or stock the studio with Lego. These strakes add some visual energy to the wheel arches. Some of the elements are reminiscent of a Lloyd's clock radio I had growing up, not so much automotive. And I think that's why the whole package is so endearing. As an electric car, it doesn't look like a gas powered vehicle, but it doesn't suffer the overwrought science experiment look forced on other EVs. It does have flush door handles. These can be slightly awkward. Owners should get used to them. Kia and Hyundai don't have kick to open tailgates. With their system, you simply stand next to the tailgate with the fob in your pocket or purse, and it opens up automatically, which is good when you're a klutz like me. The security shade can be tossed in the cargo area at an angle. There's no dedicated secure spot for it. To keep it from rattling around, you might leave it in the garage. That's due in part to the subwoofer that divides this area. That travel charge cord is standard, by the way. 
I like this slot that holds the load floor in place. I do wish there was a spare tire and remote seat releases, or at least put them here. Dropping them means going to the back doors. I'm also a fan of pass-throughs or 40-20-40 split seats, so I'll gripe about that. In max cargo mode, the Ionic has 59 cubic feet. With all the seats filled, there's just over 27. That's a little bit more than EV6. I did this test with the rear seats slid all the way back. The ID4 takes on nine bundles of my measurement metric. The Kia swallows seven, as does the Ionic. Same with the Mustang Mach-E when using the frunk. I'm thinking eight would go in with the seats slid most of the way forward. Uh, this little push is always allowed, folks. Let's move on to red light, green light. Green lights. Not everyone's gonna like the design, but damned if it isn't bold and original. The interior isn't just spacious, it's comfortable and calming. In moderate temperatures, the 256 mile range of the all wheel drive model seems easy to hit, maybe exceed. And the 800 volt charging system is a significant advantage in this price class. Yellow lights. Theoretically, charging is right quick, though I never came close to the 250 kilowatt rate, even under seemingly appropriate conditions. While there's lots of room for cargo, eh, the flexibility could be better. The ride quality is mainstream comfortable. Enthusiasts, you might want to wait for an end model. Red light, eh, mostly small stuff. I always prefer a physical spare. I've been burned by only having a repair kit. A car this brilliant without wireless Android and CarPlay deserves a demerit. Without a rear wiper, rearward visibility is a problem on rainy days. <laughs> Ask me how I know. While the charging infrastructure is growing, Tesla remains the best when it comes to ease of use. My biggest problem for road tripping with Ionic 5 and other EVs would be in rural areas where stations start getting sparse. Along freeways and interstates, I've never had issues, though I'll admit it's worrisome to see individual terminals not working at some stations. There's work to be done. Ionic 5 and EV6 are built on the same eGMP platform, but you know, at the end of the day, you need to just treat them like competitors, just like you would cross shop any other EV, like an XC40 Recharge or a Mustang Mach-E. Anyone looking at ditching gasoline would be smart to check this EV out. The designers and engineers teamed up to crank out a winner. To think, even recently, Hyundai was dismissed as a budget brand. Word is, demand is high, supply is low, so patience might be necessary. Ionic 5 is a good look at the future, styled squarely with a dash of the past. I plan on producing a video comparing Ionic 5 and EV6 in the coming weeks, so look for that. I also have a bunch more EV reviews planned, including Volvo C40 Recharge, Hummer EV, and Mercedes EQS 580. So stay tuned. The electric vehicle choices are growing quickly. I've never had so many to test in such a short period of time. I'm experimenting with 3D television. No? Well, at least I'll thank Martin Campbell for driving, getting up early on a Saturday morning. I mean, I wouldn't do that. I'll also point out my price quote service. That's very helpful these days. It's hard to buy a vehicle with the shortages and all. It's designed to save you time and running around. Using it helps to support my channel. Like all of them, mine is not perfect. I'm all about leveling with you folks. It works better in some cities and with some brands than others. It also depends on where you live and which dealerships are participating, but it's pretty good, so give it a go. Hope you got something out of my look at the Hyundai Ionic 5. Pretty cool car, and for those who say, eh, the styling's a little weird, you probably complain that all cars look the same. And this one doesn't, so I think that's a good thing. And of course, this being the end, I'll leave you with a fun fact. The Hyundai logo, what is it supposed to represent? Apparently, two people shaking hands. If you look it up on the internet, there's a graphic that demonstrates it. Um, I'd put it up, but I'd probably get flagged for copyright infringement, and I don't need that.
Thanks for watching. Remember, subscribe to this channel. You're here at the end, so I'm assuming that you enjoyed the video. Click notifications. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter if you think that's a good idea. I'm pretty active there. And if you have a question, leave it in the comments. All right? All right. That's Driven. I'm Tom Volk.